Hey, hey, welcome to The Urban Monk, Dr. Pedram Shojai, hanging out, doing something slightly different today. We're going to be looking at a picture book together. Um, my guest, uh, Peter Van Ochtmal, has uh, traveled extensively across the country uh, over about seven trips, uh, really trying to understand the heart and the soul of this country and the people. He's got a new book called Buzzing at the Sill out, um, and he's got these wonderful photos that all have stories behind them. Uh, and it's uh, very visually compelling, and I want to do a story by going through a picture book today and just kind of finding what it is that this uh, very talented photographer found while traveling through the country. So hey, welcome, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, glad to be here. Yeah, so what, what inspired the project in the first place? Like what, were you already kind of cruising around the country doing things on, on assignment or was this kind of a, a side thing or were you commissioned to do, do work like this? Well, it's sort of a combination, but the but the basic lineage of the work was was uh, kind of born from uh, working in Iraq and Afghanistan, where I started working when I was about 24, looking at the nature of the uh, the American occupation there, and uh, which led to questions about American history, about American power, about American foreign policy, which over time led to questions about America itself. What was it about this place that had led us into these conflicts that were having a uh, a pretty kind of formative effect on my young life. So, uh, and I'd realized by by being in Iraq and Afghanistan and working with the American military that that I kindly hardly knew that much about my own country. So I, I determined after about three years of that work to start traveling through the U.S. and trying to to do it without any any particular expectations or kind of preconditions and just see what I could see. Huh. And you did this over a number of trips, like we mentioned, and um, you, I'm sure, had a, a, an amazing experience doing so. Um, what was the most surprising to you as you started kind of seeing what you didn't know you were going to see? Uh, the most, it's tough, the most surprising. I mean, a lot of the things that are surprising now seem, uh, surprising then seem obvious now. Hmm. One thing that I would say I was grappling with a lot at the time was was how uh, how a place that I was from and and related to and kind of had a general respect uh, for the sort of sanctity of its history could could in some ways be so brutal and violent uh, and ignorant in its in its operations abroad and so and 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 it was in getting home and and trying to understand kind of the core of who we were. That led me to realize that this—it's really more of a fundamental point about humanity. But, but we can be very good and 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 loving and welcoming to those kind of close to us, even strangers. But that that kind of empathy almost never translates kind of beyond this very very narrow framework of kind of community and 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 like immediate engagement. So, so despite the fact that a lot of the folks I met when I was working in 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 Iraq and in the and in, and in Afghanistan and at their core, you know, didn't didn't differ from from the Americans I was dealing with at home. You know, they were such worlds apart, uh, and it was that gulf that, uh, in their perceptions, and it was that that gulf that that you know is very obvious in retrospect, but kind of was 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 painful and contradictory to realize at the time. It's hard when you're in a world, no matter how big you think it is, it's still tiny, right? Like I, I grew up in me metro LA area. It's a big place, there's always something going on, there's cars buzzing, you're at the center of stuff, right? Until you get on a plane and go to Bangkok or Shanghai or any of these other places where you realize there's this whole other world that's spinning and buzzing everywhere that you know is, is just doing its thing and your world is what you thought it was and it was big then. And so I'm sure you went into all these smaller communities um, seeing all these kind of insular pockets of thinking and, and belief systems that were different. I mean, you're in Brooklyn. Did you, were you kind of born and raised in, in the Bay, uh, in the Bay Area, in, in the New York area? No, in, in Maryland, in the, in the D.C. suburbs originally. Mm -hmm. And so how much of the trip put you into small town America? Um, I wouldn't be sure exactly the percentages, but but quite a few, in, in so, quite a bit of the trip insofar as it's oftentimes – the easiest way to engage with people in, in, in a city, everyone's moving from one place to another. There's so many people around. There's like a general wariness of outsiders. Uh, you know, f when you're in the smaller places, there's, there's maybe like a, a more of a veneer of wariness on the surface, but uh, underlying that there is a general curiosity that as a photographer, I found easier to work with because 
it's so photography is very social in that way, you know, and, and a lot of the time you have to act with the kind of in collaboration with the consent of the people you're photographing. And so, so I was spending time in those places. Also, I was spending time in those places because those were the kinds of places where a lot of the soldiers I'd been meeting in Iraq and Afghanistan were from. And so it felt important to kind of understand the nature of those communities. You know, it's hard to draw general conclusions and photography. I like photography because it's so fragmentary in its way and it's so non-narrative in its way. So the, the book is can't ever be any decisive accounting, but just very much explicitly my own accounting. So so I, I, I caution any kind of general judgments with with the kind of underlying notion that this was this was all about kind of, you know, hopefully perceptions that are superficial on the one hand and run deep on others, but but are my my own truth, not some sort of fundamental truth. Sure. Well let's unpack these truths one frame at a time and let's just let's let's walk through some of this journey with you. I, I hear uh, in front of me I have a picture of, looks like some people dancing underwater with an American flag. And then as I do this, Lorenzo will share the photo with our, our viewers. And for those of you who are just listening to this, I highly uh, recommend checking it out on the well.org page uh, so you can see the pictures that go along with this. So wh wh what's going on here, Peter? Uh, that, that picture was actually from my, my very first trip out. And, and uh, I did a lot of these trips with a friend of mine, uh, Christian Hansen, who's a uh, photographer from Louisville, Kentucky, living in Brooklyn many years too. And, uh, and, uh, I'd say I went out with him partly because I tend to have a natural kind of reticence, you know, on the road and towards people. And he's one of these characters that, that without any regard for, you know, politeness or discretion will talk to strangers. And so he seemed like the best and, and, and engage very intimately with them very quickly. And so, so he was the great guy to go out on the road with. And, and he'd heard of this place. We were in uh, Florida, uh, near St. Petersburg, a place called uh, Wikiwachi Land, which had been a roadside stop that was popular in the 1950s and 60s and had kind of gone slightly to seed since then. And what's happening there is there's this uh, freshwater, uh, there's a nat natural freshwater spring, and uh, there was a performance of, uh, of these women in mermaid costumes who would take periodic kind of sucks of air from these tubes that had been kind of discreetly placed at different points in the spring. And the culmination of uh, of of the of this routine was uh, an American flag rising from the depths, uh, while the uh, mermaids kind of swam in patterns around it. And and over the loudspeakers, this song uh, "Proud to Be an American" uh, was playing. And to me, it was a very metaphorical image for kind of starting off this project and and I like the picture now and it was also kind of important symbolically to me as the the beginning point in many ways of this journey amazing amazing and they had discreetly placed little oxygen thingies so they could just stay down there and do their thing huh exactly yeah but you also had to hold your breath for a long time it was yeah, very no impressive kidding. no kidding of course they were working kind of minimum wage jobs simultaneously so that night you know eating a cheeseburger at the applebee's it was many of the same mermaids so it was uh, serving us and and so it was an interesting thing like already the mystique of of or the veneer of this kind of fantasy land had was taken away by the setting itself, even though it was quite an impressive performance and kind of reduced even further by, by seeing them uh, kind of then out in the real world. <laughs> Who knew mermaids ate cheeseburgers? Look at that. Well, everyone eats cheeseburgers. Someone's got to eat cheeseburgers, right? I got this next one over here. It's this triangular um, cemetery, it looks like. Fascinating, really cool shot. What's happening here? Um, that was, uh, that was on the way, actually, I was on my way to a doctor's appointment in Brooklyn, I remember, that was taken close to home, because I'd severed a tendon in my finger after falling off a wall in Jerusalem about a month before that, um, but that's a whole other story, um, and, uh, and I take my camera everywhere, um, and I just happened upon that scene, and, and, and later on I looked into the, the details behind the cemetery, its history, and uh, the guy that had that had uh, founded the cemetery was this kind of very eclectic character that was trying to be an inventor, and had uh, once made one of his employees jump off the the office of the cemetery administration with a pair of wings he'd constructed. And he made him jump off at gunpoint apparently because he'd refused to do it initially, and he fell and he kind of broke broke both his legs. So, 
So that's, I'm sure there are a lot of other stories in there. A Yelp review, I remember, complained about walking through there at night and finding people having sex by the tombstones and things and, and whatever million stories in its 150-year history you'd want to uncover, I'm sure, and they're out there somewhere. But that's just two of them. That's amazing. Hey, what camera do you use, by the way, for this type of work? Um, it's all, all sorts of different cameras. I think everything from a medium format uh, camera to sort of full frame SLRs, you'd call them, to point and shoots. I think there might even be an iPhone picture or two in there. Um, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty flexible. I use I use the tool depending on what I have on hand and what the circumstance calls for. And, and you so you cruise with a kit with all kinds of all kinds of tools that you need at the time or. Yeah. Yeah, when I'm out going to a doctor's appointment, I'll just be cruising around with just a light, little, you know, a little mirrorless camera, something small and discreet I can take everywhere. But if I'm out on the road, I'll, I'll be traveling. I was just out in Iraq, and I was probably about six cameras and a drone out there with me. So you know, yeah, yeah. really depends on the circumstances. Yeah, no kidding. This this one I found to be very, very interesting and compelling. Who knows? I, I have no idea what the story is here, but I got the guy who took it. Yeah, that's uh, that's in New Orleans. That's a that's a second line, um, and I, and for those of you who've been down to New Orleans, this is something that occurs a lot of Sundays uh, during the year, and it was an interesting history behind them. You know, for, as a basic ritual, it's like a street parade, and people are going through their bands. There's a crowd just following around. There's people, you know, uh, riding their horses through the streets, and it's all kind of a remarkable thing to see in a in a big populated city like that, to just have whole big avenues shut down for this parade that's happening all the time. As people were walking through this, how the heck did so? What's this horse doing amongst the pedestrians? It's just it's just riding on through. I mean, if you'd been able to have a 360 degree view of that scene, you know, there was much the same going on to my right, going on to my left, and going on behind me. Mm-hmm. Um, but the point I was gonna gonna point out was that what was interesting about these parades is that they kind of originated in the wake of the Civil War as part of these social aid and uh, pleasure clubs, which are created in the South because insurance companies wouldn't be wouldn't give insurance to ex slaves, so they kind of created their own. The, the now uh, ex slaves created their own system, which included uh, uh, that, that gave kind of limited uh, health insurance. And as part of that, there were bands that were playing at funerals, and that kind of uh, uh, migrated over time into these uh, second line parades, uh, mm-hmm. which are pretty unique to the to the New Orleans area. Amazing, yeah. There's a, there's another piece of American history for you, huh? <laughs> that's incredible. It's, uh, endless layers. Well, that's just it, right? People are complicated, and people together is that much more complication. This one's kind of fun. I can't quite figure out what's happening, which makes it even more fun. Got the dude so, with the mask. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this is the Kentucky Derby a few years ago, and and uh, I go down there just about every year uh, since 2009, and it's just a to me it's a fascinating place because you get all you're getting all these people from all different walks of life kind of together in this one very narrow space, and there's this there's you know it's a lot of drinking and it's a lot of kind of carousing, but it's also an interesting kind of. Uh, microscope almost on 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 society and a lot of the time this friend of mine christian who i mentioned who i've done a lot of this work with we just kind of cruise around the outskirts of the derby and we just kind of encountered this guy with his uh which with what i believe were his grandchildren and we kind of exchanged a few words and asked to photograph him and and as these things often go some people are just receptive to this idea that a stranger with a camera suddenly appears and is going to kind of follow them around um, and so we sort of followed him around, photographing him as he rolled through with his grandkids through the scene of people departing the Derby at, at sunset. So it's a very kind of surreal sight and, uh, you know, one of, of many that kind of like it that didn't even make it into the book because, you know, in this otherwise kind of cookie cutter country, there's a lot of weird stuff just below the surface. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Is, you know, I spent a lot of time in India traveling and it seems like every day in India is some festival. And there's just street parades and festivals all the time, and people live for that because it's their social engagement, it's their it's their social life, it's a lot of things, and we forget that there's a lot of this that still happens on Main Street USA. It happens a lot. We you know we need an excuse to hang out, and you know this guy's partying, man. He's wearing a wearing a chromed out skeleton mask, and he's got the grandkids in tow, and um, uh, it's just what a character. 
right? And, and y you normally don't get to meet this person unless you're out on the street as well, which, which makes it fun. I, this next picture my wife was hoping um, was a sleeping bear and not a dead bear. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I'm afraid. It, I'm afraid it is a dead bear, and 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 that was part at a taxidermist shop, and uh, that was during a, a kind of a bear culling that they do in New Jersey every few years, and I just I just happened to be there with a with a friend of mine who I think had an assignment to photograph it, and you know at that moment I was very struck. I mean, a lot of this this work in this book is kind of born from these experiences I've had in these conflict zones, and so there's you know there is a you know, meditation on, on, on death throughout. And, and I remember when I saw the bear, I, I was struck to some degree by the innocuousness of the setting and kind of to some degree by the humanness of the, of, of, of the, of the body. And, 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 and then there was this kind of beautiful light at the same time. And so it was this kind of combination of factors that attracted me to that scene. Yeah. That's fascinating. It's very, it's, it's very somber. You know, part of, me, part of me wishes he had a bottle in his hand and he just drank himself to sleep that night, but um, yeah, yeah not, not, not quite there. Um, and so you said this is in Jersey. I didn't even know they had bears in Jersey to, to the degree where they had to cull them. So the, the well, I mean, whether or not they have to cull them, that's, that's, that's subject to uh, interpretation. Right, right. Who are these guys? This is Kentucky Derby again. This is... Uh, Again, after the Derby, which is kind of where a lot of the, the work kind, kind of seems to bear fruit. Um, and these are just some folks, look like pretty well-heeled folks coming out of the Derby. And and uh, I just happened upon this scene, I remember, with, with Christian. And and, uh, and he was kind of he was kind of messing with them a little bit because he's from Kentucky and he tends to not be particularly find particularly appealing the real preppy folks and so I remember him he was messing with them a little bit and at that moment I took a photograph and uh and it because and to me you know this picture it's of real people but it's like and it's factual but it's fictional at the same time in that it's like an expression in a lot of ways of my of what my interest and feelings were in, in kind of these issues of, of of class and race that kind of came to the forefront a lot in this in these travels through America. You know, you can't you can't avoid those two ideas as kind of two of the defining terms of, of how we live in this place. Any idea where these kids were from? Not the faintest clue. No. The picture in many ways, you never know if it utterly is misrepresenting them too. Right. I mean, photography, you know, a lot of the time is as you as you see in the book, there's a pretty deep dive into the context and the individuals. You know, I'm very I'm both familiar with the individuals and the place where they're coming from, and then there are moments that just happen spontaneously in a one two fiftieth of a second that uh, that uh, that I'm not I'm not aware. And in those so in those cases, there's you know there's artistic license that comes into account, which is always you know which is an ethical question in a way that's dogged photography since the very beginning. Well, these girls look pissed. So whatever he said, whatever he said, got him got him set off. Um, no, it's, they, they were they were pissed. I think. Well, he shifted into kind of trying to charm them, to trying to alienate them within a breath. And I think it was in that breath that I captured that photograph. That's a hell of a pivot. Was, I wish I'd had the audio of it actually. Well, you know, that's that's how he is. That's what makes him an interesting person. Yeah, exactly. Well, he's a good catalyst for, for, for photography. This next one is the most fascinating of the lot. Um, and I, I, I'm dying to hear where, where, where and how and what came of this and where it went from there to me. Well, th this is part of a extensive series on the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, that was part of multiple trips. This is actually the only one in the book. Um, there's quite a bit of other work, but that's more going to be a part of another project, a book project down the road. So what had happened there was, was I linked up with this uh, Norwegian journalist, uh, Vegas Tenold, who's been looking at far right groups in the United States for the last kind of half decade. And, uh, and he established a pretty good relationship with this chapter of the Ku Klux Klan that was uh, based out of Maryland, but had members from kind of uh, around the region. And they'd invited him down there for kind of a barbecue and, uh, and, uh, and it was a swearing in ceremony for a new member. And, and then there was a kind of extended rant about, um, ISIS training camps in the U S, uh, being run by the UN with the kind of collusion of 
Barack Obama or Barry Sorturo, as they called him, Sorturo being the, uh, the name of his uh, mother's second husband. And, uh, and this, so there was a lot of interesting pictures, a lot of kind of good pictures in the scene, but this happened just at the end as, as the clan member was, emer- as this clan member was emerging from the woods and this kind of ghostly, strange scene greeted me. And, and, and that's when I took the photo and it, it kind of visually kind of represented that event in many ways better than the, than the other parts of the narrative, which, which I prefer just to write in the book to give people the context for which the picture was taken. What was it, what was it like being at this meeting? Like, I mean, are you, are you scared? Are you, are you fine? I mean, you're a white guy, you're, you're fine being there. Like what, what's happening in your, in your head as you're sitting there listening to this banter? Well, if, if I hadn't, if I had been just wandering in there, I certainly wouldn't have been welcome, but I was with someone who'd established a relationship with them over a long period of time. So I felt safe. Um, you know, relatively speaking, there was no booze or drugs around. So that always helps. And, and frankly, I've been around so many strange characters and so many difficult circumstances from kind of, uh, you know, Hamas and Islamic Jihad who are a lot easier to deal with, frankly, than the KKK and, uh, to you know, I've been throughout throughout the world in difficult circumstances, and uh, so this was just one one more difficult circumstance. And you know, it's just kind of your gut that tells you when things are okay and when things may be escalating to a point that you're gonna have to leave. Um, in this case, you know, things went pretty smoothly, but it was all very kind of choreographed for us as well. Not this moment per se, but other moments of it were were certainly choreographed for our, for our presence. Yeah, yeah. So what what makes the KKK harder to deal with than Hamas? Um, they're just a bit they're a bit more unpredictable, I would say. You know, so in you know in Ga- take Gaza where I've been, take a Islamic Jihad group. You know, once you make a, a at least in my cases when I've met when I've made appointments to kind of meet and photograph some of their uh, combatants. Um, it all proceeds very formally, very bureaucratically, almost very politely in all cases. And it's uh, very professional, frankly. You know, with, with, with the guys from the Ku Klux Klan, um, you know, my, the writer I've been working with it had, had cases of having guns pointed in his face. You know, there's the unpredictability of certain members who were maybe slightly mentally unstable that, that – um, or that just really don't want journalists around, or maybe have been sipping on something, you know, behind the scenes that 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 complicate things. You know, there's there's an unpredictability to the chain of command, I guess you could say that 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 makes people a lot more difficult to be can be under control. Interesting, and that's like a, a, a across the board thing that he's experienced in all his all his stuff with the with the KKK as well. Or are they just kind of renegade cowboys at you know at, at their heart or something? I think some are, and I think some aren't. Like any other group of people, it's made up of disparate parts. It's just that some of those disparate parts are a lot more unpredictable than in most kind of organizations mm-hmm. of people. So, you know, but he's been doing it for years, and he's still still going. So, you know, he's been able to ultimately negotiate, um, you know, with them to the point that he hasn't gotten hurt. Yeah, well, that's good survival s- skills. Speaking of cowboys, this looks like a it looks like a Latino cowboy ranchero ball of some sorts. What's happening here? Yeah, this was a uh, this was a rodeo out in Malala, Oregon, and it was yeah it was after a concert, the tail end of a concert, and I, if I remember correctly, some kind of hits had just come on on the radio after the band finished up, and and everyone was getting in their last dance, and there was this kind of beautiful woman with the bright red lipstick you see in the frame and and i just was kind of very struck uh and intrigued by her in the midst of that whole group and so i was waiting for that moment in my head when she would be looking at me and no one else would and 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 finally that moment came up came about after a few dozen attempts probably at some point she was looking at me because she was wondering who the hell this white guy was that kept kind of following her around taking her picture. Totally. So <laughs> Why I'm sure that was it as much me? as anything else. Yeah, well. But at the same time, she was okay with it. I mean, if people don't want their photograph taken, you can find out pretty quickly. I'm not hiding what I'm doing. And there's a funny unspoken relationship that often goes on between photographer and subject. Um, oh, no, she's looking through your lens. I mean, you could just look away. <laughs> you cover your face. Like she's, she's looking right back through your lens at this. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah she's looking right at me. Yeah. But I'm not looking uh, through the viewfinder either. I'm looking at her with my eyes and my camera is down kind of around my uh, around my neck. Ah, interesting. I'm looking so, down at the viewfinder. I use an LCD viewfinder where I'm not looking through with blocking my face, but my face is always visible, which always helps with that process of engaging with people when you don't have a camera hiding your face. Right, it's less paparazzi. I only have time for a couple more, and then I could, I could, you know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. This is, it's so much fun getting stories out of pictures, it really is. This next one's really fascinating to me. It's these two guys, I want to say wrestling, dancing, I don't know what the hell's going on here. That, well, that was it. That was Juve, which is this uh, West Indies Day parade that happens uh, every Labor Day weekend in New York and uh, throughout the Caribbean. Um, and there's a big, big population of, of folks in the Caribbean there, and there's it's an all night parade. And uh, and this was just one of those moments. Again, it's something I've gone to quite a bit the last few years because I have a friend that that lives right by there, and we'll usually kind of. We usually have a party at his place the night before, and then out late uh, we'll go out, and people are kind of covered in motor oil and 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 Is paint. That, that's and motor oil that's on these. That's guys? motor oil. Yes, yeah, so that's motor oil on those guys, and people cover themselves in paint and costumes and parade through the streets. And it was just one of those moments again about the kind of serendipity of photography, where uh, these two guys just. I just kind of heard a sound, or maybe I felt a certain instinct, and I saw these guys kind of run past me, this guy, one guy carrying the other, and I just turned around and snapped a frame, and, and it happened to turn out kind of, you know, perfectly as I'd hoped for, and and that was that, was that and then I never saw them again. Epic. Um, motor oil. Don't try this at uh, home, kids. Motor oil does not absorb well through your skin the way you want. Um, well, <laughs> combined with a, what was probably plenty of booze as well, it was... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess at that point it doesn't really matter what's absorbing uh, through your skin. This next one, I'm going to go a little faster just because there's um, there's a couple more I want to cover. Um, sure. This next one here um, is fascinating. I, I have no idea what's going on here, but this guy is an amazing, elaborate looking character. Yeah, that was uh, so that was on the 4th of July, um, about seven years ago, I guess, 2010. And I remember, you know, I was it was another one of those moments. I'd bring a camera everywhere I go, and 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 in fact, in the, I remember in the previous week I'd had some kind of disappointing news that it hit uh, uh, from this agency I was in the process of joining that had called into question to some degree my uh, faith in my own kind of talent, I guess, as a photographer. And, and I remember that was the first good picture I took after that, um, mm. where I found this guy in the street and we had this kind of, again, just a very brief engagement. You know, I, I just said, as I often to say to people who I'm intrigued by, I want to photograph that I thought, you know, that there was something amazing and, and beautiful about him. And could I take his photograph? And, and he kind of turned around and said, yes. And I took one or two frames and, and that was it. And that's how a lot of those engagements go. You know, you, I try and capture the spontaneity of the moment and not let it get too, people get too self-conscious with the camera in front of them. Yeah, yeah. And that's an art. That's an art in and of itself is the, that engagement, right? Because, yeah, this is, this, is, this is a moment in time that, you know, is beautifully captured. This yeah, kid looks like he's in trouble. And are you sitting in your car trying to figure out what the heck's going on here? No, that was on the that was at Pine Ridge, uh, Dakota Sioux Reservation in South Dakota, and I was actually a, on a ride along with that police officer uh, who you could see on the left holding the taser. And uh, uh, there's a lot of crime on the reservation, and and we had been kind of responding. I'd been with him as he responded to to one thing or another, mostly alcohol fueled. Um, all night. I mean, there's no, there's no industry or economy, uh, really jobs around the reservation and, and, and liquor itself is banned, but a, a small town with about eight residents has been set up just, uh, across the state line specifically to sort of sell, sell, uh, booze to the Lakota Sioux at inflated prices. And so, so a lot of this crime is, is alcohol related. And, and, and at this particular point, I remember we We'd had there had been a call that had come in that some people were getting beat up. We drove up to the scene. There were two guys lying unconscious at the scene, um, badly beaten up. And and kind of at that moment, as as the officer was searching with a flashlight, we saw this kid take off running. And the police officer, I don't know how he did it. You know, he took off running after him, wasn't able to catch him, 
jumped in the car and drove with his lights off around the series of streets to, I guess, head off where he thought he was coming from. And, uh, and you know, I'd gotten a good eye on this guy. He had these very distinctive uh, cowboy boots. And sure enough, we, we came out just where this guy was emerging from the bushes in those same distinctive cowboy boots. And at that moment, the officer jumped out of the truck with the taser and, and arrested him. Wow. He looks young. I bet he couldn't have been older than 14 or 15 would be my guess. <sighs> was he involved in the beating? Uh, yeah, he was He was brought to the hospital and identified by the two men as the perpetrator of the beating. And a baseball bat was uh, found. Man. Man. Looks like a sweet kid in a lot of ways. But he really it does. Sounds, sounds pretty likely that, that, that he was the one that did the damage. Yeah. Where is the reservation here for the Lakota Sioux? South Dakota. South Dakota. This kid, it's like iconic farm country uh, farmer boy. Where'd you take this? Uh, that's that's out in Darien, Wisconsin, uh, and that's the son of a, of a friend of mine, Raymond Hubbard, who uh, who I met originally in in my kind of documentation of these wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. His father had. Uh, been a soldier in the Wisconsin National Guard and had been hit by a rocket uh, on his base in Baghdad on July 4th, 2006, and had received, lost a leg and received really bad shrapnel wounds throughout his body. He was in a coma for a month. And I'd met him um, just when he was at the end process of his treatment at Walter Reed Hospital, which is near where I grew up in Maryland. And we became friends. And and uh, and at some point, I went out to Wisconsin to, to kind of try and further the story I was doing about him and, and that's where I met his son and took that photograph and actually that was about 10 years ago now and that son has a son of his own now. Wow. Wow. It's amazing how that happens, huh? Yeah. I mean, photographs are like the ghosts, you know, ghosts of time. <laughs> Speaking of ghosts, um, does she remember this night? Oh, very much so. Uh, that well, that's that's my buddy Christian and his girlfriend, and you know they're both characters. And I don't know what they were doing. That was late at night. I mean, we weren't even in bad shape or anything. We were just having kind of a, a like our own impromptu dance party with a few people in the, the parking lot of a I don't even know what it was uh, late at night, and they started dancing and twisting and twirling, and that's where that picture came from. Amazing. That's a, that's a yes. great snapshot, right? That's just it's it's like this perfect moment in time. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful moment. This one right here is one of my favorites um, of the batch. Um, I can only assume what's happening, but you tell me what's happening here. Um, well, these are some guys that 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 I met again. I met outside the Derby. It's interesting that you're picking a lot of the Kentucky Derby related photos, and uh, they. Uh, we, you know, I was with Christian again, and we just kind of encountered them on the street, and just started chatting with them. And they were they were flush with cash. Uh, maybe if, I'm not sure if they won it on the horses, or there's a lot of kind of folks from the community that like are selling water and beer and and hot dogs and chips and stuff to people going in or coming out of the the Kentucky Derby. And like a lot of these interactions, one thing just kind of led to another, and they're like, "Hey, can you take our picture for Facebook?" You know, and so we started setting up these different photos. It was like a collaboration with them about how they wanted their photo to look for Facebook, and uh, and eventually, you know, this is the pose that we settled on, and they enjoyed it, uh, loved the picture, scooped up their money, and kind of went on their way. So you know how, and that all happened in a space of about two minutes, and and that's again one of the funny things about photography is like it, it you know, you, people see you with a camera, and it and it, and it provokes all sorts of unexpected circumstances. I like how the dude on the right's wearing loafers. That's that's a strong look. Yeah, uh, they were they were pretty cool guys. I gotta say, yeah. they had a good time. They look it. Okay, last photo we have time for. What is happening here? Uh, and this so this is a picture in uh, this is in Detroit, and uh, and I was riding in a car actually with uh, with another friend of mine, and we just kind of drove past the scene. You know, it was the dead of winter, not a lot of people on the streets. Uh, hard to take photos, frankly, and kind of at that moment, um, you know, we passed by these two what looked like, you know, people dressed in Statue of Liberty costumes, obviously from the Liberty Tax Service, uh, looked like they were almost conspiring with this 
kind of amazing collection of colors and the white of the snow. And, and so, and, and, you know, on the one hand it was aesthetic because all these pictures have to be good, fundamentally compelling and mysterious photos to have inclusion in the book. You know, they have to have, uh, but they have to have to my mind content as well. And, and, and that picture uh, in some ways was, was a reflection of like, you know, these, this ambivalent relationship I have with all these like, these kind of sanctified symbols of America that then become like weirdly twisted and used in like in a case like this as you know, costumes for a tax company in the dead of winter in the bleakest of possible surroundings. So it's so it's those layers of meaning that attracted me. Well, in Detroit, which is such an iconic American city that's taken a nosedive, at, you know, and, and is trying to make it back, sitting parked between a liquor store and a check cashing um, bench with uh, some people who look like they're, you know, probably not happy being stand, standing out there in the cold in the first place. So this begs the question, what did you learn about America? Like, what, what have you learned about these, these experiences from your travel that you would like to share with my audience after, you know, seven trips and multiple photo tours? And there's so many more pictures, y'all. So, like, if you, uh, you know, if you're at all interested in, in continuing to go, uh, his book is, you know, filled with these pictures. It's called Buzzing at the Sill. Um, but so, so yeah, tell me, tell me what you learned. Like, how did, what did this cook inside of you? How did it shift your perspective on this place we call home? Well, you know, there's the tendency, I think, in the U.S. to to try from the outside world and internally to have kind of to, to create narratives and oftentimes a kind of monolithic narrative of what this place is and what its people are and what we mean to ourselves and what we mean to the rest of the world. And to be honest, what I found was every level of that narrative dismantled you know it's not that the core ideas that are kind of promoted by you know to some degree by our educational system by our cultural institutions uh you know sometimes the kind of myths that are propagated through you know the class or the race you're from i mean all these ideas um by politics all these ideas get thoroughly deconstructed when you, for me when i had the opportunity to kind of engage with all these diverse range of communities to the place that there was one certainly not one idea of america or americanness and uh and and every experience i had in some ways contradicted the next so you know in, in a way it left me with a much more uh rich understanding of the place um but on another level, it really left me wondering what this place is at all. You know, it's 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 so many millions of places simultaneously, and it and it made me realize almost the dangers of of language and of narratives at all. Um, and and in a way, since I've been doing a lot of this work, I've tried to to you know dive as deep into the histories of this place and the other places I work as possible to try and and form as an objective and understanding as I can away from all the kind of sanctimony of, of the sloganeering that kind of is so commonplace in most societies and is really superficial. So that's, that's the long answer and maybe the incomplete answer to your question, but it's the best I, the best mm -hmm. I got. I don't know if there is an answer, right? It's complicated, right? We're, pe we're people, we're infinitely complicated and putting us together makes it that much, that much more complicated. And, you know, a national identity for a, a country full of immigrants that came and, you know, parked up and uh, took, took over land from people who lived here earlier. I mean, it's, it's just really freaking complicated, this place, these people. These people. But, I mean, you're, you've captured the story of life on multiple fronts, which is really fascinating to me. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you're, you're still going to be on the road. You're still going to keep doing work like this. I mean, you know, when, when would it end? I mean... It, it seems like something that's almost like a like an addiction, a bug that bites you, huh? Well, there is no end because the story is constantly ongoing, and and in reflecting on the present and thinking about the future, it's it's a lot about reflecting on the past as well. And and you know, I'm I've, I've been doing this kind of work now for about 12 years in total. This is my third book. You know, there's another I'm working on now, and and a lot of ideas yet. And. And my hope and expectation is that I keep kind of diving into these questions because they're they're endless, and and I want to form an understanding for myself, and hopefully in the process, you know, create a thoughtful kind of perspective on this place for other people as well who don't necessarily have the same opportunities uh, to go around as I have, as through my work as a photographer and as a photojournalist. Yeah, yeah, you're lucky in that way, and we're lucky to have you uh, bringing all this work back for us to enjoy. Thank you. Um, 
So it's good. So my, my guest, Peter uh, Van Ochtmel, um has been traveling the, the country and the world. And uh, the book uh, that I'm looking at now is called Buzzing at the Sill. And uh, man, thank you so much for doing this work. Thanks for being on the show. And I wish you the best. Uh, keep sending, you know, keep sending uh, notes back when you're back from uh, your trips or you got a next book out or something. I'd love to see it. Been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Sorry about the, uh, the technical issues. All good. Some things are out of our hands. Yep. Let Indeed. me know what you, let me know what you think. I will see you next time.